hi, hey, hi. I think you all could hear the difference between those three ways of saying hi. One was Norwegian, one was Swedish, and one was English. The reason why you can hear the difference is that our ears are quite good at such tasks, which I mean is the purpose of the ears anyway. But that was only an introduction to the talk. Um, since I came up with a very long title for this, I will also spend maybe some words on it. Uh, by simple control, I mean non-complicated gestures and movements. Uh, by complex sounds, I mean music that you make that is actually not that easy to produce, which is ah, a, a bit advanced musical output. And by expressive communication, I mean the uh, way that we can tell other people how we feel, uh, what our physical or emotional condition is right now. Um, I'm going to talk about a project that uh, I have called the Soundscraper. Uh, the name is taken from uh, how DJs scrape the sound on the records. You will see a bit more about that. Uh, the Soundscraper is some cross between a musical instrument, a toy, a pedagogical method, and maybe a diagnostic tool. Um, it is purposed first and foremost for uh, children with hearing uh, impairments, uh, but we can also use it with other uh, groups we have seen. Uh, the two most important things I will talk about just now today is uh, that it offers an uh, augmented or alternative way of communi uh, communication if we have a person without uh, the verbal communication learned. If they have, for instance, been born deaf and never acquired those skills, then we can open a door by using alternative communication in the form of expressive music or expressive sounds. The other thing is completely different. Uh, it's, uh, we have heard earlier talks today about all the kind of sensors that we have in the mobile phone. We have uh, accelerometers and all kinds of sensors. But I still think there is space in this world for just normal push buttons, on or off and I will show you a way to use them as continuous controllers. Um, my background, I will also just spend a few words on. I did my PhD on scratching. And what's interesting to me is uh, how you can move from this very simple interface. I will play it again because the sound was not there. I hope. Yes. How can you get from this very, very simple source material, sound source material, to making a musical expression, as we will see this DJ do, only by changing the speed and uh, putting the volume on or off? I think this still is very amazing. Um, but I did not put this into this talk just because I think it's very good music. But it also has some uh, importance to what I'm working on now. Um, DJs, they make music by changing very noisy signals over the whole speed that they can uh, master with their hands. So the, the signal, as you heard, will go up and down in pitch all the time over quite a large extent of pitch, and also with a very yeah, noisy uh, signal. And that is very good if you happen to have a cochlear implant. And cochlear implants and scratching in this way met for me. Um, cochlear implants are also often called the bionic ears, or artificial hearing. And they are basically hearing aids, but uh, you insert through surgery, one component into the 
cochlea of the ear. And uh, on the right, you can see uh, those two uh, tubes that you insert into the cochlea. They contain an electrode, and this electrode stimulates the audio nerves directly, the auditory nerves. Uh, unfortunately, this does not provide a very, very good signal. Uh, for one thing, the, the pitch resolution is very, very bad, which means that uh, you might not be able to hear melodies. And that's uh, when I found out that using very broad noisy signals could actually be good. Um, one group of uh, cochlear implant users or uh, hearing impaired people have worse conditions than others from the start with. Uh, if you are born deaf and have, for instance, other problems such as uh, motor, uh, motor problems, you can have um, co late cognitive development, then there's a quite big risk that your language will not be developed as it should. And if you don't get attention early enough, or if you are implanted late in life, then the communication with the, uh, with the environment and the world around you will probably not take place as it should. So this is a group that uh, we have found out we really need to find a way to help. And uh, we think that by offering this other way of communicating, by sound, uh, then we can probably start to find solutions. Um, I will show you soon a video of uh, two boys playing with the sound scraper. Uh, the video I will warn you first is really, really bad sound quality and even worse video. <coughs> that's too bad, but that's the way it is. Um, and you will see those two children play. And the toys in themselves that they play with are really, really not exciting. One is a plastic car, and the other is just a plastic something, piece of plastic. Um, but they do spend a lot of time with this. And <laughs> this just keeps starting. Um, they spend a lot of time with this, and before we started uh, the sessions with this, we were not sure how much they would react to sound at all because they hadn't shown to have too much reaction to the sound. So we'll see this now. Uh, I will, uh, during the, the play, I will just turn off the volume, wait a bit and put it back on and we can see what happens. <laughs> So what do you think? Do you think they could hear anything? Yes. It was quite clear from their faces, their expressions, that something happened now. So um, the first result we found was that actually we can establish proof that, that hearing exists. And we can establish this proof only by letting the children play with a toy that is quite boring in itself, but they can at least control the sound output from it. 
Um, going over to uh, more about cochlear implants, I would just recommend you to watch a video on uh, the TED conference series uh, by Charles Limb, who talk about music and CI and why music sounds so bad with cochlear implants. And I will give you a little demonstration today about about how it sounds. You've all heard that before today, I guess. This is the traditional Swedish song to sing on this day. And um, it's usually sung like this with a normal choir. If you are going to make a simulation of how this will sound with a cochlear implant, we can use software to do this. But the software can only take us this far. We can only know if the sound is actually produced in the software. And then we need a person to say that, OK, this actually sounds exactly like this in my cochlear implant. But then that person must have a cochlear implant, know how to describe the sound, and also could relate to how it sounds originally. So we can only take the next simulations as some rough estimate on how it sounds. But first, uh, one example. That was one version. If you use a different algorithm for uh, transcoding the, the signal. This is a best case scenario. Um, if during surgery you're not able to insert the uh, electrode, all the 25 millimeters, it should go into the cochlea, but only 20, for instance, and you have a uh, less advanced the cochlear implant with only eight channels, it might sound something like this. Now, if a child is reluctant to listen to music that you play, it can be a reason for it. This does not sound very good. So uh, our thought is that if we use instead music signals or sound signals that we know we know how that they will not sound good anyway <laughs> they are just noise then at least we have a good starting point um, the next part I will have to put this away uh, I will give a little demonstration what I talked about this button interface that I like to push buttons um, if we are going to see how sound affects uh, children or how they can use sound, the interface itself should not be too interesting. It should be quite boring actually. And the one I will show you now is the third one there, the most boring of them all, and probably this will be the most low-tech ever shown in a TED, but <coughs> we'll see. Yes, with wires and all. Um, I have four buttons here. If I press one, something happens, but not much. If I press again, the same. If I start pressing a bit more, well, at least I can get some more control of the whole thing. And with some training, only pressing four buttons once in a while, I can actually get something that you can probably discuss if it's true, but it could be at least a bit expressive. And it's very easy to control it. So what we have seen is that simple gestures, they can be used to produce very complex sounds. And, and uh, we had one challenge, and that was that never in two sessions in a row we could use the same configuration, even with the same kid. So 
that's one uh, argument of using very simple technology, so we can always redo it uh, in an instant while we're there. And uh, not surprising to us that the preferred sounds by the children are very seldom the same that the caregivers think are the preferred sounds. And with that, I would say thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>